Hello and welcome to an incredibly exciting conversation tonight with the Cambridge Union. I'm Keir Bradwell, Speaker's Officer-Elect, and today I am extremely excited to welcome freelance writer, author, and Twitter phenomenon, Hussein Kesvani, who will be interviewing someone who I think it's fair to call an era-defining online cultural personality, Cambridge graduate, Caroline Calloway. I'll hand over to Hussein, but I'm obliged to point out you ought to subscribe to the Cambridge Union on YouTube, find us on Facebook, and obviously follow us on Twitter too. Hi. Uh, this is very, uh, this is very new to me, so I'm sorry if, uh, I sound a little bit janky or, um, that things might feel disconnected. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, um, hosting me, uh, even digitally. This is a very, obviously like an interesting time. It's a very interesting time to be talking to someone like Caroline, um, who I feel like everyone who is even sort of like remotely online, but definitely if you're extremely online, you'll be very aware of who she is and you'll obviously have various opinions. When I was asked to do this, uh, I kind of used my Twitter account to ask my followers what they would really want to ask Caroline. And my inbox has been really busy all day today, uh, which kind of just goes to show what, how much of an impact Caroline has had on Twitter and on internet culture generally. Most people will know Caroline Calloway through the article in The Cut, um, The Cut magazine, which uh, sort of detailed her life as an influencer, but was written uh, by one of her former friends, or maybe one of her friends, we can talk about that in the conversation, uh, Natalie Beach, who sort of uh, talked about her being a ghostwriter for Caroline. But some people who have tuned into this live stream will know Caroline as a Cambridge student. She studied history of art uh, at St. Edmund's College, and there were lots of Cambridge students who came into my DMs to also tell me stories about the parties that uh, she had. Uh, before we go into the conversation, I just want to introduce myself very quickly. My name is Hussein Kizvani. I used to be the uh, Europe editor of Mel Magazine, which is a online digital culture magazine, which has written about Car Caroline, I think, a couple of times. Um, I also published a book about religious culture and Muslim culture in Britain, uh, which was published last year. And I uh, co-host a podcast called Trash Future, which some people listening to the stream might be familiar with as well. So um, let's kind of let's go into uh, questions straight away. Uh, so Caroline, you have been described as many things. Uh, you've been described as a writer, an influencer, an artist, a modern day celebrity, but You've also been described as a grifter, a scammer, and a charlatan, to name a few. As one of like the most divisive, but also one of the most famous people on the internet, how would you describe yourself? And do you think any of these descriptions hold any weight or any authenticity? Um, thank you guys both for that really kind introduction. Um, I, I also want to thank everyone who's watching this live stream event because I definitely would not be watching it if I were a Cambridge student. I would be deleting the emails from the Cambridge Union as soon as they came to me and be like, this is spam. I don't want this. So like, thank you so much for taking the time to find their YouTube channel and watch this. And as for the um, list of things I've been called, I mean, you forgot so many. You forgot narcissist. You forgot toxic friend. You forgot criminal. You forgot slut. You forgot, um, gosh, so many names. Like I, I've been called lots of things and I'm sure I'll be called lots of things in the future. And I hope I will because I think that, you know, art is meant to be disruptive when it's done well. And a lot of people don't see me or my online personality or my online content as art, but I'm glad that it's disruptive and I, I consider it art. And so I expect to be called a lot worse before, before I go to my grave. And no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that true. You know, I often say that if someone has a problem with me uh, my personality, um, my business, they can text me. And if they don't have my phone number, then they don't really know me well enough to be making comments on who I am as a person or the inner workings of my business. So I think most people would have been introduced to you by via the cut article, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, I'm not like you're wearing the t-shirt, which says you don't recognize the cut, and we can also talk about that as well. Um, but before all that, it strikes me that in 2015 or before, when you kind of first 
had a public persona on Instagram, you kind of lived a fairly normal existence and you were charting and you were charting your experiences as an American who was studying at Cambridge. Um, and your Instagram feed was like described as kind of a fairy tale experience because of its high level of curation and showing the kind of real enchantment and beauty of the Cambridge campus. So in a Vice article in 2015, um, when I think you were interviewed, you were so, but you were sort of like aware of those contradictions as well. So while you were trying to seek an authentic kind of British experience as uh, someone who I think describes herself as like an Anglophile, um, you were also very aware of like the metrics and how the algorithm of Instagram worked at the time. And indeed, in like in terms of like trying to build an aesthetic, you were also kind of you also needed to understand how that platform worked. So I kind of I wanted to ask you first about influencer culture or even just like your aesthetic you're thinking around aesthetic during that time. Um, and the idea that like in order to like indulge in this fantasy that you had about Britain, you sort of had to like make, you had to make it coherent to the algorithm itself. And this is obviously at a time when we're viewing Instagram, not just as like this app that people like use very casually, but something that can be monetized and something that can like be an extension of like a personal brand and stuff like that. So. I guess like my question is like how like what formed your thinking around the purpose of your social media and by extension social media during your time at Cambridge during like 2015-16? Um, wow I, as someone who has trouble like doing Cambridge exams which are like one essay question that is one sentence long like I'm the sort of <laughs> test taker where like halfway through my paper I'm like what was the question like what was I even <laughs> answering these paragraph long questions are going to be a huge challenge for um, my attention span, but I'll try my best to answer this. First of all, though, you were like, you lived a pretty normal life. And that is the craziest thing anyone has ever said to me, including when they called me a narcissistic toxic slut. My life at Cambridge was not normal at all. I was literally working full time making this business while being a full-time student while being in my first adult relationship while trying to make friends and have genuine connections while trying to live all the experiences that I could then funnel back into my business and on top of that I was trying to get this brand off the ground I mean like I remember for my drinking society initiations I literally had to leave midway to take a phone call with I think like the the UK Times or something like that like it was just and what was so weird was that I I was so shy about it too because I I almost felt guilty that I wasn't having a more normal college experience or more normal Cambridge experience and I remember like when I left those drinking society initiations to like go take this call like in the parking lot of St. John's Chop House. Um, I, I didn't tell anyone where I was going. I was like, oh, I'm going to the bathroom and like went out into the parking lot and like did an interview pretty wasted. And like those sort of odd moments, I think really categorized 2015 for me, you know, sort of ducking out of grand, you know, everything from like study halls to like sh shitty pre-drinks to like go field a press inquiry that I was trying very, very hard to get. I know it's like difficult to believe now, but there was once a time when I was begging these reporters to write about me. I was like, please, I'm important, please. Mm. Um, <laughs> now my manager's like, what questions do you plan on asking her? I wanna screen them first. My manager sent that to Hussein before this, um, <laughs> this interview. But um, yeah, 2015 was really tough. And, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm currently publishing my um, response to Natalie's piece, which has been so amazing. I've used the chance to, I, I'm so sorry, by the way, I, I haven't turned off my email notifications and it's just, it's too late. I would just like panic if I had to like go into settings and figure it out now. So that's just going to be like, a nice little mm. symphonic orchestral part of when the screen goes to me. Mm. But um, also if I get a text, I'm sure it'll ding, but um, it's really not my fault that I'm so popular. Um, I'm joking. I really just like, I'm kind of panicked about this and don't want to like figure out how to turn it off right now. I guess, but, um, I, yeah, I guess what I mean is that like, 
even though that's like a very intense situation for anyone who's like in their undergraduate, I think I, what I meant was like a conventional sort of influences trajectory where it's one where you kind of gain popularity um, almost like in conjunction, so it's, but it's not like integral to like the rest, or it's not kind of integrated into the rest of your personality, right? So you can, so you're kind of doing the whole like social media stuff um, while you're kind of doing your studies and while you're doing um, extracurriculars and everything. It's like, it's basically like, it's not as, it, it doesn't feel as like integrated into your life as maybe um, it is now, or it doesn't like essentialize you. You kind of like, you can separate your content from who you are as like a student and for your like other identities. Well, yes. Um, I, I was getting to the point that if in my response to Natalie's piece, I talk a lot about the Adderall addiction that I was dealing with uh, during all three years of my time at Cambridge. Adderall, for all the British people watching, is a study drug. It's basically legal amphetamines or legal speed in the US. And the fact that I literally have to explain to a British audience, like what Adderall is, should give you all the information you need to know about why it was so easy to hide this for three years at Cambridge. I literally would just like take it in front of people. They'd be like, what's that? I'd be like, oh, Adderall. And they'd be like, okay. Um, but I, that addiction was like, it was really, really serious. And I was also dealing with, you know, like suicidal depression at the time, which I say really, offhandedly now or I, I don't know I still don't know the right way to like talk about it I feel so I feel even weirder being about like I was mm. unwell struggling than I do about like offhandedly being like oh yeah like I like didn't really see the point in living like both ways of explaining it feels so wrong but like I I was so connected to my content, even more so in 2015, because I really used it as like, a, honestly, like a coping mechanism for my shame. Um, I just felt so broken. And, you know, like I, it really was a vicious cycle because the more that people commented on my photos being like goals, because it was 2015 and the, that's what we said online in 2015. Mm after I, you know, like walked eight miles in the snow to make my Instagram posts back in the day, but people would be like goals. And I would be like, I don't like life. And people would be like goals. And I would be like, you know, awake for the third day in a row because I'd taken that much speed. And so I really, as I felt like I was sort of drifting away and becoming like increasingly unmoored from the normal world and from like an interest in life, I sort of used my online presence to like, I don't know, to sort of like counterbalance that shame. And it's something I'm still unpacking in therapy. So like I, if I'm doing a bad job explaining it, it's because I don't fully understand it. But um, I, I also uh, take issue with you being like, you know, like it wasn't like a normal influencer, like you had a better ability to right. like compartmentalize your life. One, there was this fucked up like shame, addiction, perfect outside shell cycle going on that was like a very tangled knot. And on top of that, in addition to like contacting reporters and like trying to get myself out there, I also, the way I built my Instagram following was I bought 40,000 followers. And then I, before, the F the FTA laws about disclosing hashtag ads existed. I bought ads from specifically book fandoms. Like I knew mm -hmm. I wanted not just followers, but readers and not just readers, but readers who were predisposed to become obsessed with what they read. And so I targeted accounts like Harry Potter, The Fault in Our Stars was big then, um, The Hunger Games. And I would run ads for myself with these accounts um, so I'd have to create the ads, write the ads, find the accounts, send the contents to the accounts, make sure they went up. Sometimes I got scammed because like this was, was like PayPaling money to like strangers on the internet. And it was, it, it took so much time mm. and it was really tough. Yeah. I wanted to talk about, um, I w cause that sounds like, that sounds like a very, <laughs> like very crazy period, but I want to talk about a crazier <laughs> period now, which okay. is, um, the post cut stuff. Um, I don't want to like talk too much about like the ins and outs of the article because number one, you are in the process of writing responses, right? Or you are like writing responses to Natalie. 
Um, yes, I've published yeah. the first. Um, it's a three-part series, yeah. and yeah. I'm using it to raise money. And so far, we've raised over fifty thousand dollars for COVID relief. Right. And the funds from I'm hoping to get to a hundred thousand dollars, and I want to donate the next fifty thousand dollars to the Equal Justice Initiative, which works on racial inequalities in the American prison system. Cool. Um, so I don't want to like talk too much about like the details of like all the kind of like dis the, the kind of gossip disputes about the cut. But one thing I found very interesting was as someone who sort of just kind of found as one of the people who found out about you via the cut article, what I found interesting was how it kind of became inserted into like online discourse and particularly Twitter discourse. So it's kind of something that's very common these days. But a story which was really from what from my first reading was a story about a relationship between two friends and two young women in this very kind of like intense academic climate in a place of like, you know, economic insecurity and everything. Um, it eventually kind of morphs into this story about like privilege and power and um, how power dynamics like play out in friendships, about the nature of influences. And more importantly, I like it was the first time that I really saw a kind of really concerted discussion about the, not only like the realities of influencing, but the kind of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that sort of exposed the internal mechanics and the capitalist logic behind uh, influencer culture. So I guess like looking back on that, I wonder if you thought that the article was like a turning point in influencer culture or like even online culture more broadly in that the demands and expectations that were put on you and now other influencers were going to be far greater and also far more scrutinized because of how many people could kind of like engage in this conversation and also how as someone who sort of exists online and understands herself as like an online character whether that's like an artist or um a writer or something like that like you can see all this like play out in real time i sort of wonder whether that kind of informed your decision on how to respond to natalie which maybe like from again like this is also something that i'd be I, i'd be fine keen to find out what actually happened was it something that like you had to manage with kind of managers and agents and stuff like that or was it something was was the response to natalie something that you kind of constructed on your own like how did you rethink your online identity after that particular moment well um Sorry, I'll, I... try short, I'll try shorten the questions <laughs> <after this laughs> one, yeah i mean i'm really making cambridge look very bad because you're asking me all these questions and i'm like well thank you so much for those interesting questions here's an unrelated anecdote to everything you just said <laughs> and i feel like um you know I'm going to keep living my truth and I'm going to try to mm -hmm. answer your questions, okay. all 30 of them, but more <laughs> likely this will end up like I'll get halfway through this and I'll be like, I'm telling an unrelated anecdote, That's aren't okay. I? But, um, but let's, let's try and jump into it. I, I think honestly, as you were talking, I was sitting here and I was like nodding um, and just sort of like silently freaking out behind my eyes because I was like, should I just tell this guy that I disagree with everything he just said? Or should I like go along with the questions in the effort of like, like making this like a more professional mm. and coherent Zoom meeting? But honestly, I totally disagree with everything, okay. all of the questions, like starting with that you thought that it was like a really interesting thing about online culture and the help that people need. Mm. I mean, it's, Natalie and I worked together for two periods of six months over a span of six years. Mm. I'm sorry, two periods of three months over a period of six years. So six months total. And she was very careful to take the, um, the focus of the reader's attention in that essay from when we worked on Instagram captions before my Instagram was famous and then when she helped me write my book proposal after I had become famous and sold the book and established the brand. And I think she was, Natalie's brilliant. And I think she, you know, she started writing that article when I went viral as a scam. She literally started it like, as soon as I was being canceled, uh, she began work on that article. And seven months later it was done. And I think she was very smart to, um, to really tap into a lot of um, sensitive topics in our culture, which are like the idea of having like 
you know, the pretty friend and the ugly friend or the idea of like the influencer and the person who does all the work, like the brains behind the operation. Mm. And like, if I read that article, I mean, if I read it, when I read it, I was like, damn, this Carolyn Calloway is very dumb and very mean. She has mm. no idea how to run a brand. Like, thank God she had Natalie to hold it all together. When in mm. fact, like Natalie actually wasn't part of my, I was away in Cambridge for three years while I wrote the captions that made me famous and sold the ads that built the brand myself. And although, although, you know, I think it is interesting to think about how influencers have help. The truth is that we don't fit as perfectly into that narrative of, you know, the pretty dumb face who just like was the sort of the shell and yeah, you know, Natalie who was, had less power but was doing all the work and like that yeah. sort of complicated dynamic that she tried to present yeah. and I also disagree with you when you were like do you think there's more pressure on influencers now no I think I think you know things there's such taboos around um around so many things online like when Natalie released her article it was pretty taboo that I'd bought 40,000 Instagram followers but like now I the more that I've been unburdened of that shame mm -hmm. and just been able to tell the truth, like I actually feel it's like one of the smartest business decisions I've ever made. Like yeah. starting with that bump and then building the brand from there, genius. Yeah. And like other things like buying ads and like hiring help. Like I, I paid Natalie for her biggest work was when we co-wrote the book proposal and like I paid her 35% of everything. Like I treated her well as an employee and I think you know when Natalie emailed me to tell me that she was writing this article for the cut like six days before it came out she wrote me this email it was a couple paragraphs and this anecdote is actually going to be so fucking related to your question it's actually like dazzling like this is not going off topic at all oh well, I mean fingers crossed but um she wrote me an email it was a couple of paragraphs she was being like she was like, I'm so glad that, um, you know, you've gone over your addiction. I know that recovery must have been like so hard for you. And like, I'm really happy that you're, you're well now and you're not sick anymore. And that email, as I said, a couple of paragraphs, like her essay is almost 6,000 words long. Like it's a long piece. And she does not use the words addiction or recovery or depression mm. or sickness once. She's very careful to um, erase my mental illness from the record because, you know, by presenting my behavior high out of my mind on amphetamines as my like sober personality, she mischaracterized fundamentally like the core of who I am and, you know, my struggles with mental illness and your next question, which was like, did your management like sort of try to like regulate your response? And the answer is no. The biggest obstacle mm -hmm. to writing this response was my father uh, died of suicide the week that her article came out. Mm -hmm. um, I found out the day after the day after Natalie's article came out. And in fact, the last day I spoke to my father was the day that I got Natalie's email telling me sure. that she would be writing for the cut. And the reason it took me seven months to write this article is because like, I'm really mentally ill. Like I'm, I struggle with suicidal depression. Like I, I go to therapy three times a week. That's a lot of therapy. Like that's, that's like renting two different apartments in New York city, which is extra ridiculous. Cause my one apartment that I'm renting is uninhabitable because of the global pandemic we're living through. Um, but like I, it wasn't a management team issue. It was me just, you know, in addition to dealing with that public shaming of, you know, really getting characterized as just like the worst things I ever did during my addiction, like, you know, like not remembering um, or just like leaving her alone at that bar, making bad decisions like that and like not being a better friend or being more conscientious coupled with having like the business that I built taken away from me, like that authorship taken away from me coupled with my father's suicide. Like that was a lot of trauma to recover from. And that was 
that was the obstacle to making what I wanted to make because, you know, I'm a writer just like Natalie and I wanted to really be in the most capable, clear headed space to write an artistic response. Mm. And I mean, I mean, I guess like when I asked you to kind of like when you're looking back as in like when you're looking back now and just you're like, I'm so sorry, you didn't understand any of the questions. (laughs) No, it's okay. I mean, like, I, I guess, I guess like it's, it's more just about kind of how people like put stuff out there, Even, like whether you're artists or writers or anyone who's like really in the creative field and, you know, these discussions about owning your means of production, but also like being able to own your narrative and like what that means at a time when we're kind of all dependent on like platforms and stuff. So the thing that I was trying to get at was whether the, whether as like the cut article like began to kind of get shared and like the discourse is sort of became, you know, they weren't necessarily like centered on you, but they were kind of about, you know, these broader questions about, you know, power and uh, like privilege and stuff like that, whether this sort of informed how you think about putting out your content now. So for example, like when it comes to self-publishing, when it comes to self-editing, when it comes to like producing your own art, even when it comes to like curation of your social feeds, like your, you know, like your Instagram and stuff like that, like when you kind of have more ownership over that, it's sort of like, do you think that like that's, more comforting it kind of gives you more of a sense of control over how you express yourself and how people like understand and relate to you um can you repeat the question i'm joking you don't have to um (laughs) i i think i think that i certainly i certainly had a sense of a loss of control when natalie i mean like Imagine if someone published an article called I was your first and last name and told the story of who you are, but left out the one detail that, you know, is the thing that's been most dangerous to your survival in this world. And the literal reason that you don't have a father anymore like that. It was so, um, I I mean, it's funny that you look at it um, as like having control over your Like if I feel empowered about it, I don't mean to be like glass half empty, but like, I guess Mm. when I see it, I see the, like the pain of just having like my, it would be one thing if Natalie had like included depression or addiction, which so fundamentally characterized um, those five years of my life, Mm -hmm. Um, but she didn't and she purposefully left it out. And you know, what's so fucked up is like, if I had been her editor, I wouldn't have changed a thing. It's a better story, leaving it out. Like people love to root for the plucky underdog and they hate the rich in long form prose. And the more complicated and nuanced you make a story, the more you the more you risk leaving your reader, reader unsatisfied. And like, I think Natalie's power as a writer comes from being very like cinematic and Hollywood. And she made a very cinematic Hollywood story. Mm-hmm. Um, But as for being empowered now about like having more control of my stuff or like has this affected how I think about self-publishing or like working with um, other brands, I mean, not really. I, I think it affects how like, you know, I, no, because the thing is, it's not like I was working with a bunch of brands before and like, say like all my sponsorship deals got pulled because of this article. And then I had to sort of like forge new ground. Um, it, I really just want to make the things that I want to make. And, you know, just as Natalie's strengths are like in the sort of cinematic element of her prose, I think I, my strengths are my weirdness. Um, I have a high risk tolerance. I like experimenting. I like, I, I'm a lot, um, I'm more of a loose cannon as a person and a writer. And it's a great weakness, but it's also one of my strengths. And so the reason I like self-publish or do anything online is really just to um, make the things I see in my head come to life and I'll really take whatever I really don't think much about like larger questions about influencer culture or like all that stuff I really just think like okay how will I Mm -hmm. make the thing in my head and then I just without having to compromise creatively and then I just set about making it does that answer the question at all and and it also leads to it also leads to my next one actually very well which is like do you think it do you think like the term influencer is an outdated like is outdated like do you think that it's sort of 
like when we're talking about people who are influential online, who occupy particular elements of online celebrity, which may not kind of like entirely make, or, you know, I, I think about like TikTok stars, for example, but I also think of like people who kind of blow up on Instagram for things that aren't like directly related to like advertising or capital or anything. Do you think that like influencer, the way that we understand, or even the way that I understand it um, is outdated? Yes, to and, be honest. Yeah. Um, so I think you're so great. I met, when I was talking <laughs> with his editor, Alana, we were like, ah, oh, he's the shit. Like, he's like, you're like, he'll love you. He has such, she said specifically that you have really good politics, which, you know, we stand a woke king. So like, I love that for you. But, um, okay. <laughs> but, but no, I, I, I do think it's outdated. I think, yeah. um, cause you know, like I'm, I, I think there's just like, as we, as more and more online content is generated every second of the day, I think that we'll just have more and more niche communities. And like, I, I, it used to be that like on influencer, there were like a couple main on influencer on Instagram that they're like a couple main influencers and they like had more of a monopoly. I definitely mm. think that will break down and you'll see people like getting a lot more niche and a lot more just like mm. people will find exactly what they want and but I don't think influencers are going anywhere like I I think I I think the idea or the um the practice of popularity made visible by um online metrics is here to stay mm. so you did um you did art history at Cambridge right yes uh, and you are also like an artist you produce you produce art and you sell art um yes. you told me uh and by extension, like I, so I've been thinking a lot about like curation and how we curate stuff online, whether it's like in our Twitter feeds or in like in our Instagram pages and stuff like Instagram, I guess is like the most kind of obvious way, but the way in which like we curate ourselves online um, and particularly at this moment of time where, um, you know, so some kind of internet celebrities or people who have like high note, they've been criticized for like not using their big platforms to uh, promote uh, Black Lives Matter causes or to promote organizations that work with um, marginalized Black people or like the POC communities. Uh, also at the same time, people who uh, post stuff, but they, you know, so the, like the Black Square, for example, is a really interesting um, example of this where people, where lots of people were kind of promoting their Black Squares and then a few, you know, uh, moments later, like a lot of them took it down or they rehashed it because they found out that like the algorithm wasn't necessarily, or it was like pushing down like the really important posts. So I guess like as a starter question for this section, I wanted to ask you about curation. Like, do you think that like, you know, so I, 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 I'm a big fan of like your Instagram stories and just how many stories there are um, on those, uh, on those things. Do you like curate them? Like how, when you're kind of pushing out content, when you're producing content, and you do so intentionally, like, do you kind of see that as curation? What is your thinking behind putting out, like on a normal day, like what is your thinking behind like putting stuff out? Um, that's a great question. And the honest truth is I try to be as like Kerouac beats poet about it as possible. I really am aiming for that like stream of consciousness. I, my friend once told me that she described my Instagram stories to because they're mm. super weird and they're super unlike everyone else's Instagram stories and um someone was like what the fuck is up with Caroline Calloway's Instagram stories like is that what she's like in real life and my friend was like it's less what she's like in real life than what I imagine the experience of being Caroline is like for her inside her own head and so I I've always really loved that explanation shout out to Morgan um and she it really stuck with me. I really just tried to make um, my Instagram stories sort of like, I think of it as like a 24 seven reality TV show that's broadcasting my consciousness and just like what I'm interested in. If I go down a rabbit hole of like being super hyped about something, obviously sometimes I'll be like a little bit more strategic in my Instagram stories if I'm trying to push a new product so I can keep the lights on so I don't have to do brand deals. Or if I'm trying to raise awareness or raise money for a cause that I care about, I'll, I'll be like, swipe up, swipe up, swipe up, like normal mm. 
normal Instagram story. You know, you know how Instagram stories go. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I really just try to not think too much about it because I know that there are a lot of people who make fun of everything I post. And if I think about that too long, it's just, I become paralyzed with self-consciousness and that's just not the sort of artist I want to be. So you can like, do you still consider the stuff you put out on Instagram to be art? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I am um, in the late 1800s when the camera was first invented, yeah. people were like, this is science. This is technology. This is too democratizing. Anyone can buy a camera. Like to be a real artist, you have to go to art school. You have to learn how to paint. Only painting is real art. And like now almost every major national museum in the world has a photography collection. And I'm not saying that every tweet is the next great American novel, but I'm also saying that every novel is not the next great American novel. I just think that social media, like any expressive medium, has the potential for like human greatness. It's just sort of like sublime self-expression. And mm. I think Instagram is no different. I, it's so fucked up that a sentence I write, you know, printed in a bo book, the same sentence is somehow less intelligent, less valuable, less important if I put it in an Instagram caption. And that's like a really real bias that we have in this world. But I happen to, despite, despite all the people who definitely roll their eyes when I'm like, yes, my internet content is art. I just can't deny that I'm so fucking in love with all the strengths of of the internet, especially Instagram as a medium, like with pastels, you know, you can smudge colors and get really good tonalities with shadow. Ditto char charcoal or, you know, with glass blowing, you can make all these beautiful designs and shapes and smoothness of space and sculptures. And what I love about Instagram is that it's one of the only artistic mediums that you can, artistic media that you, in which you have like the ephemerality of it disappearing immediately you have the interconnectivity of being like I don't have to wait for anything to get published to speak to people I mean you have the immediacy of it like I, it's just it's current it can respond in real time to real events and I just yeah I just get so excited about that and I but, just yeah I was gonna say I'll ask like do you think there's like a contra do you think there's like a contradiction in the sense of like seeing it as a vehicle for kind of pushing out, maybe not a vehicle for like distributing art, but, but as like an artistic, um, as like a mode of artistic production within itself. And what I mean by that is, again, like at a time when there are lots of like criticism about people with big platforms and big followings, not like understanding the contemporary needs of like the current moment when it comes to social activism and highlighting injustice and everything, where that kind of, level of you know does art necessarily can art be like reconciled with that or can your kind of understanding of how art on instagram reconcile with like the kind of very material needs of the current moment well i mean i think it's just like you know are a lot of norman rockwell stuff were ads or magazine covers for the saturday evening post he was paid for them they were commercial projects and you know some of them were too commercial like I you know you wouldn't really say that like a, a coca-cola ad from the 1950s is art but like sometimes commercialized stuff can be brilliant and provocative and boundary pushing and or beautiful um and so I just I don't think there's any like blanket answer for influencers because I think a Lots of, you know, there's some girls who are like so basic on Instagram and like their problem is they're not posting about, about politics enough. And then they're like, I don't know, people who need to pay the bills and are just like, maybe, I, it's just, it's so complicated and there's just no one size fits all answer. Um, I've forgotten what the question is, but I'm still uh, speaking, <laughs> so. No worries. I mean. <laughs> on, 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 a, on, 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 like, on like contemporary moments. So one thing that happened very recently, um, and I'm not sure if like, I'm sure like you've seen actually, is the um, Colston statue, the Edward Colston statue that was thrown into the uh, river in Bristol and how that sort of launched a um, ongoing number of statues either being defaced or being uh, 
uh, you know, just get gotten rid, like gotten rid of and stuff like that. One of the big things that's happening right now is obviously in um, Oriel College, Oxford, where the statue of Cecil Rhodes is currently um, being debated once more. And the tides are very much looking at least at this moment of being able to take that statue down. One, wow. thing that, one thing that I was thinking about though, was like during the 2015, 16 moments when the Cambridge aesthetic very much like fed into the, um, your kind of online persona, your online brand. And like, I guess that period of time when you were known as like the American girl really experiencing a particular regal type of Cambridge, whether you kind of look on this moment and think like, rethink your relationship with the Oxbridge system, knowing that like lots of the architecture and lots of the things that make the Oxbridge campuses enchanting come from this period of like British colonial um, interactions, right? Like whether they directly or indirectly affecting colonial policy and therefore like colonial violence. I wondered what your relationship or like whether you've kind of rethought or reckoned, like reorientated your relationship with uh, this institution that as far as I'm aware, you still have um, a lot of affection for. Um, I mean, bro, bro. The problem is so much worse than Cambridge and Oxford. This is like, this isn't a Cambridge Oxford problem. This is a history of art problem. Like mm. this isn't like all the things that I love aesthetically about these institutions are dripping in blood. Everything I love about art ever in the Western curriculum can be traced back to at least not everything, but 99% of all the objects that we consider valuable today were made with money. And that surplus of money came from colonialism. And I, of course, my attitude towards it has changed. I really feel like it's so terrifying the way that we expect not only our public figures, but each other to sort of like spring from the head of Zeus, like as this like fully formed woke Athena's like that we just, we'd never want to see the process of someone learning. We just want them to be learned. Like we just want the finished product of them knowing everything. And that's such fucking bullshit because we were, we're all still so racist. We've been so racist for so many years. And anyone who says that they're not racist now, that they've like somehow like magically like removed all the poisonous biases in their head are fucking lying to others and especially themselves in a way that benefits absolutely no one. And so, yes, my opinions have changed. I was so blind to white privilege when I was at Cambridge and I can choose to either, you know, sort of wallow in the guilt of that um, and feel like I was the only one or I can be honest with myself and be like, you know, a lot of people are waking up to the situation. Um, my journey with racism started in 2018. So like I am better than you because I started earlier. I'm joking. Obviously, I'm a white girl. I'm so much dumber than you are. I have no idea about marginalization. Um, <laughs> don't worry, I won't be canceled for this. I'm truly post cancellation. I would like to see someone come for me on Twitter. We can, yeah, we can talk. We can, yeah, we can talk about cancellation in a second. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I my views have changed so much, and I know the most palatable thing for any not just public figure, but person. Like if we were just friends at a bar, like it would be most appealing for me to like come out here and be like, yeah, and my like unifying theory on art history and like how I justify it is this and like to have just sort of like a, it's, we don't really like it when people say that they're still learning and they're still figuring it out and they're unsure, but I'm still learning and I'm still figuring it out. Mm. And I'm unsure, do I need to reject all the art history that I love? I love art history. Do I need to like shun Cambridge and Oxford? I love Cambridge and Oxford. I like, look at this little guy in the bottom hand corner, Keir Bradwell on our call. Look at him, he's just so, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> but the way that we, okay, like on YouTube, you're only seeing my face, but on my screen, I'm seeing everyone in the call. And Adam, the president of the union is so fucking lucky he blocked out his screen or else I'd be like, Adam, so adorable. I just like, I love these little like posh British kids who just 
they're so well-meaning and I just have such a soft spot for like their culture in my heart and I don't know yeah did I not feel that way because I think of it, I mean clothes? I think I think it's more to do with just like what <laughs> Oxford and Cambridge like sort of represent and something that like you acknowledge as well you're popping off in the group chat right now these are um <laughs> These are um these are like elite in these are elite institutions which at least kind of in the 19th century but like even kind of lasting until today they sort of you know they like trade off their eliteness they trade off their like exclusivity and like the cloister like how the maintenance of those cloisters and the maintenance of that type of architecture comes for, like you know in order to exert that type of exclusivity and you know that type of exclusive that type of exclusiveness like definitely feeds into at least like the stuff that you were known for back then and like stuff that you're kind of known for right now right again like you know being a cambridge person being someone who really believes in or like you know at least kind of believes in what kind of cambridge represents aesthetically um you know so that's kind of that's kind of what i was trying to get at it wasn't necessarily like disavow but it's more just about like how your relationship with those types of elite institutions change when you kind of know that your persona or like your like you know some of your kind of public persona comes from that place of interacting with like british elite institutions yeah i mean i i definitely made that persona because i was trying trying to compensate for how tumultuous my like interior world was and my mental health at the time. And I was definitely trying to like, I think compensate for just like how deeply fucked up I felt inside. And I wanted to build a business and I knew, I, you know, every fucking rom-com, it's the same thing. It's, it's like Hugh Grant, Julia Roberts. And I was like, this will sell and like the business woman in me like man that choice i had no idea mm. how lightly i needed to like tap the gas pedal of like that whole american in oxbridge ideal to i had i had no idea that like so many years later this is what i'd be known for if you could count up all the posts I've ever made about white supremacy dating back to 2018 or trans rights or climate awareness or Jesus fucking Christ. Just like every day I make tens of those posts in my stories, on my grid and how much people associate me with my political views, which is not at all. Um, and how much people think of me as like, loving the pit club i've maybe talked about the pit club like four times on instagram in my goddamn life and i've talked about political issues that are important to me tens of thousands of times and like it's just strange to me you know i never even wrote about going to a cambridge ball if you go back like look at the instagram look at my posts well, I, the whole three years I was at Cambridge, I never wrote about going to a May ball on my Instagram once. And like, it's what people associate my content with. And it's how I can tell people who have actually read my posts, it's okay that you're not a true fan, Hussein. <laughs> I will forgive you. I don't think you're my main demographic, but like you obviously <laughs> didn't read my fucking content. Um, but like I, I, my first May ball that I like live posted I did it last summer, 2019. I, I graduated. I went back with my friends to like new college ball. Um, and I'll probably go in three years when it happens again. But like, um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I, it was more of a follow It was more of a follow Also, I'm aware that we don't have okay, too, okay. We, we don't you know, have too much know. time yet. Sorry, I got and... so fired up. I just got distracted. Yeah. No, no, no. We, 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 we don't have too much time left. And Wait, quite, can I yeah. do something that I think would be really funny? Oh, sure. Okay. 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 Let me talk so it focuses on me. Ask right. me a question that's one sentence long. Uh, <laughs> um, how's your OnlyFans doing? My OnlyFans is <laughs> doing great. <laughs> you should all subscribe to your my OnlyFans, www.onlyfans.com slash Caroline Calloway. It's, it makes a really good Cambridge graduation present, you know? It's like sort of the perfect present for that Oxbridge grad in your life. Um, 
okay. so let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about let's talk about OnlyFans. Let's talk about OnlyFans because you got a lot of like criticism from the sex worker community, but you also got a lot of criticism just like generally about being on OnlyFans. And part of that was um, part of that criticism, as far as I understand, is because of like your like public persona in a space where some sex workers kind of view it as like a means of material sustenance, um, you know, in order to kind of continue working, especially during the pandemic. Um, I guess there were other people who criticized your um, your venture to OnlyFans really just on the basis that like this was more, I mean, the, the criticism that I got was more to do with how maybe it was kind of, uh, how, how, how do I frame this? I'm sorry, now that I, now I've got my, uh, now I've got my words messed up. Um, why don't we start there? Like, why? Like, what? What was your thinking behind like going on OnlyFans compared to say TikTok or like other platforms? Or are you on TikTok? I'm not on TikTok. Okay, so what? What kind? But of I have. What... I do have a notes folder in my phone of TikTok <laughs> ideas, but I just I don't have time. If TikTok were paying me, I'd make TikToks, but like yeah. I don't. I just I have other things to do. But I love watching TikToks, so I am like, you know, hip. Because the thing that I've noticed about you is that you're very good at like adapting to platforms and you're very good at like understanding what the platforms demand of you and how you can succeed on platforms. So like what made the OnlyFans kind of appealing to, I guess, your demographic or a demographic that maybe weren't there on Instagram or on Twitter maybe, but they would be there on OnlyFans? Well, honestly, I was going to publish my Natalie response with a major news platform which they were really chill about me pulling it last minute and I hope to publish a different piece maybe with them someday but I pulled it and instead of getting you know all this money I sold it for ten dollars a pop for charity and I'm really happy that I raised fifty thousand dollars for COVID relief because like world peace I'm just so, um, what's the word, angelic and just not a scammer, but um, but I needed money. Like I, I, I'm a writer. The things I make that people pay for are writing. And then I gave that away for free, this piece that I've been working on for months. I mean, you know, like Natalie sold hers to the cut for $5,000, like, and it's easy to be like, to look at that as being somehow wrong, but like, she's a writer. It's how she makes her money. And so I needed a way to make money and OnlyFans, I just felt like no one thought I'd actually do it. And there's nothing that makes me wanna do something more than being underestimated. And so I signed up for OnlyFans and it's quickly becoming the most lucrative thing I've ever done in my entire life. Like it's actually demoralizing, like how much people are paying to see me naked. Uh, it's not as much as they're paying to read my writing. So thank you patriarchy. But, um, but yeah, I really like it. And I think it's so fucked up that people are like, oh, you shouldn't be on OnlyFans cause you like, you, you should save the money to be made by the other sex workers. Um, that is the most fucked up communist bullshit I've ever heard in my entire life. Like name another profession where you'd be like, oh no, no, don't enter that profession because other people who aren't you need to succeed at that profession. Wait, how is it like, communist? I, I, it's just, it's the idea of, okay, maybe I don't know what communism is, but I, <laughs> but I, I think it's communist in the sense that it's like, oh, you have too much, you can't have any more. Like in the sense that it's limiting like how much wealth I could accumulate, like somehow other people get to decide. First of all, I'm not that rich because I gave away that money from the essay, which was the most valuable thing I had at that time. Mm -hmm. And second of all, I just, I really believe that sex workers should be more protected in their industry. I think there's a lot of room for reform. I don't think that they should be lose respect or just anything for dabbling in sex work mm. but I don't think a way to solve that is by telling other people who can and can't be a sex worker 
Mm. I mean, I guess like one of the things I remember was also you kind of did this caption about being the only Cambridge grad to be on OnlyFans, right? And that yes. kind of caused a little bit. And was that like, do you think that, that was just because of like how that was perceived as kind of elitist or snobby? Do you think that like, because I, I, I sort of remember looking at that and thinking, okay, well, maybe what's actually taking place here isn't necessarily about your participation in OnlyFans, but it's sort of like how you present yourself on the platform and how you kind of like understand yourself in relation to other people on the platform who are kind of like doing different things. So there's lots of people who use OnlyFans really as a means of kind of labor and as a means of kind of, you know, you know, sustaining themselves and like being like able I to- Like I do. You Sorry? know, people like me who use OnlyFans as a way of but like themselves. as but, but like but like as their main way whereas and i mean i mean i guess like as you kind I of touched do. on that in terms it's of my main source of income yeah um so do you kind of like see do you see yourself like in the kind of same category as them like as like the sex workers who have like moved to only fans as a means of like working while they can't like be out or where it's more dangerous for them to be out because of like their like interactions with the police state and just with like uh, laws that discriminate against sex workers Listen, I'm glad you brought up that tweet because I, I, it, it frustrates me. Um, you know, I think I've done such a good job of surviving being canceled. I think like, like me, James Charles, maybe some other people were sort of like the poster children of like being canceled and then just like <laughs> continuing to persist as a figure in this culture that is people talk about um and that tweet uh, when I said I knew that the exact words were I knew something like I know this is going to be provocative but a provocative tweet but when has that ever stopped me before I think I might be the only person on OnlyFans who went to Cambridge and then because this tweet was a fucking thread that no one fucking read it was a two tweet thread the same like go back and look at this tweet. The time it's not like I added this 15 minutes later. The timestamp is like these tweets went up at the same time. I was like, but I re I'd be so happy to be proved wrong. Like, let me know. Mm -hmm. And people did not read that second tweet. Um, but I think it's because you know the one lasting effect of being canceled, no matter how well you survive it, is the only permanent downside that I can tell is that you permanently lose the the benefit of the doubt like people just don't they don't think like oh maybe maybe she, maybe she meant it kindly or maybe she's a good person like you just lose that benefit of the doubt um which is why I knew it was going to be provocative but I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's so such bullshit that people don't look at the second part of the tweet. And as someone who's been very canceled, I really don't like open my DMs to people. I'm not like, oh, contact me. Like I get contacted enough every second of the day without soliciting more <laughs> of it. And so like, mm -hmm. I really stand by how I phrased that tweet of being like, prove me wrong. Like I, I phrased it in the way that is like, if you're the one person mm -hmm. who like can prove me wrong or has information, that can prove me wrong, like contradict me, but like, don't contact me. And like, I, you know, a really lovely podcaster responded to those tweets and she was like, for a marginalized community, like you should be careful about using like kinder, gentler, more inclusive language, especially because there's so much emotional and physical violence around sex workers. And I honestly really, I really appreciated that input. And I thought about it and I think Olivia's right. And if I try to find, any other Cambridge grads on OnlyFans, which as of right now, I still haven't found any. I found one girl who went to Oxford who hates me, although I retweeted her OnlyFans and I wish her all the best. But um, but yeah, I if I tweeted about it again, I would maybe make my, my phrasing gentler because I think Olivia Gatwood had a good point, but like I stand by what I said. And if you know of anyone on Cambridge, only fans. So I only, I've been told that I only have time for one more question. And I think like okay. the stuff you were talking about, about cancel culture was an interesting one because my last question was really about apologies and kind of by extension being or staying relevant. So you've kind of issued apologies for posts that you've done very recently. So like things that were 
things that I found or things that were like sent to me in the run up to this interview was a um, image of like an like an image with like anti semitic like an anti semitic image or an image with anti semitic connotations, which was full of a hashtag like things that rich people buy Natalie's talent. And there was another post that I think you did. I don't know the date, but maybe it was like more recent, which was about the bat going down on someone um with like i guess the implication that this was like covid like the covid patient zero now you i think you apologize for both of those things no um, i i only apologized for one i don't oh, I apologize okay. for things that i'm not sorry about i see okay so we can i mean we can talk about like so actually that's an interesting way to go into like like number one what do you think is worth apologizing for on social media now and number two where like apologies are very much part of like how someone who is notable or someone who is influential or has a platform, like the way in which they sustain that type of relevance online. Um, what things do you think are worth apologizing for and what not? And like when you're doing an apology, because like one thing that I noticed when you were doing the apology was that you kind of blamed it on your, you weren't kind of like projecting it onto anyone else. You weren't kind of saying that like it was an external condition. You were very much kind of saying that this is me and this is on me and I need to kind of do the improvement like going forward. Um, where do you think like the apology, like, yeah, where do, like, what do you think of apologies on social media now? And when someone does it, like, what are the conditions in which you do it? And what are the conditions that you don't, or you don't need to? Okay. Well, the anti-Semitic cartoon, which, you know, did you know that umbrellas are anti-Semitic? I didn't. Um, but umbrellas were seen as the sort of a symbol of the pretensions of Jewish people's claims to upper middle class mobility. Um, and, you know, I really, as a lover of Harry Potter, I really, and a, a girl who was raised on Disney, like, I think I've really been, be, been desensitized to the idea of like hooked nose villains. Um, just whether it's like a Disney witch or like the goblins at Gringotts. And I, you know, I take full responsibility for that. Like it's a privilege that I've never had to learn about those associations because they just didn't affect me. And I think that's, you know, if you try to mix what you should apologize for with like how to stay relevant, you will fuck yourself up so badly. Like you, it's you can't mix the two like being relevant should be like you know making I don't know just what you shouldn't think about it about like trying to be relevant you should try to make the best things you can make and you should try to think about apologies as like when you as like just being a good person and like when you actually have something to apologize for and like with that anti-semitic cartoon like I totally did and it was totally on me and it was such a blind spot for me. As for the bat, so I posted this photo of, it's shunga, which is erotic Japanese art. And the woman's clearly wearing the box sleeve of a kimono. She's like lying back, getting eaten out. You can see her kimono sleeve. And it's in the tradition of shunga. And this art history major still stands by the idea that like, fuck you ignorant people who think this is Chinese. Like this is a Japanese lady getting her pussy eaten. This is not a diss towards Chinese people. And if you don't know what Shunga is and the j very Japanese tradition that it represents, I'm not going to apologize for your ignorance. But as someone who like understands intimately, and this is like my final like follow up, I promise. Um, uh, as like someone who like understands like the dynamics of social media, like very intimately and sort of understands that at this particular moment, like, you know, images and connotations can be interpreted and reinterpreted. And this is like one of the reasons why it seems to me anyway, that like you're, you really want to kind of take ownership of your work and like how it gets articulated and how it gets understood in the world. So understanding that implicitly, like doesn't that kind of put more of an onus on you to at least kind of explain or at least kind of understand why people might be offended by this, especially in this particular moment in time? I can, I can understand that. And I do have empathy towards it. Um, but you know, I think you really, when it comes to apologizing, as I said, you really just have to think about it in terms of being a good person and your own moral compass. And the reason I apologized for the anti-Semitic thing was because like, I didn't know and it was on me to learn. And if I 
go by, you know, the inner compass that like it's on everyone's shoulders to learn about what an image means and really learn what that image is saying, then by that same standard of logic, it's mm -hmm. on the viewer's shoulders to understand that that's a Japanese image. And that I was honestly making a commentary on the, um, it says, thanks for watching, subscribe for more. So are we just like no longer on this or what's happening? Oh no, no, they're like, no, keep talking. <laughs> well, I was going to end on a note of like, it was more of a pro pussy eating post <laughs> and more about like, I think it's fucked up that like guys, <laughs> I don't know, there's still a double standard. And like, I think it would be so funny. The idea that like, you know, you want heads so badly you're getting it from a bat and that's how Corona starts. I still think that's hilarious. I have one more question before we end. You have a question. I have a really important question. All right, go on. Here, what's the funniest thing that's happened in the group chat while this interview has been going on? Because you, my friend, have actually been sweating with laughter, just like, just like, just like wiping your brow, laughing so hard. Oh no, it's just very hot in my, it's very hot in my flat, that's all. No, not um, you, Hussein, here. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. This is a very wow. good question, actually, because it gives me a good excuse to um, help wrap this up. I should say uh, thank you very much, Hussein and Caroline. The answer to your question is people got very excited that I'd become a very temporary celebrity there. Um, I should uh, thank you both for what has been a fairly uh, remarkable event. Um, and I ought to say at this point, the Cambridge Union does not necessarily share the views of the people uh, we invite. But on behalf of the Cambridge Union, um, I would like to extend a huge thank you uh, both for joining. And obviously thank all of you at home for watching. If you enjoyed this, do join us tomorrow at 5pm for our panel on climate change with Extinction Rebellion co-founder Roger Hallam, Martin Rees, Alice Will and Will Wilkinson. There we go. Thank you all very much. Again.